William Ginobili. I'm the president of the Osteology Foundation, and I'm also a professor at the University of Michigan School of Dentistry in the United States. So today I'm very honored and privileged to have this opportunity to meet with Professor Istvan Urban. And Hello. Ishvan is the leader of this symposium. It's the second international symposium on hard and soft tissue regeneration. And so, first of all, congratulations on this meeting. It's already a resounding success. Thank you very I much. Heard, I heard how it, it uh, basically sold out within days, and it's so well represented, uh, from what I understand in your opening, over 44 different countries represented. And so, uh, Ishvan, I'd like to talk to you, you know, as you think about the goals of this symposium and how it all started two years ago. If you want to give us a brief history about it. So, uh, <clears throat> we were thinking about doing a symposium about specifically on regeneration and to have a symposium with diversity. Not, I'm, I'm usually representing guided bone regeneration, but, but I want autogenous blocks and other approaches to be represented, also in the soft tissue, so even, tech, even clinicians who are doing complete, completely something opposite, but they're masters in their field, and that will, you know, these um, perspectives will give very good information to, uh, to doctors, so that was the idea behind this. Yeah, and as I saw, the way you've had the symposium set up, you have these hands-on workshops, where you can, you can really work with some of the earlier stage clinicians, but also there is so much here for experienced seasoned clinicians. And uh, again, it's very impressive how you have individuals in the soft tissue regeneration, hard tissue, and then looking at, as you mentioned, autogenous materials. What do you think about some of the future aspects as this symposium has grown that you think are some of the most exciting in our field as it relates to re tissue regeneration? Well, that's, that's what we really want to explore, <laughs> to, have, um, to have people like, like you who's, who are pioneers in research, and we want to have you know, these ideas of researchers and the ideas of new ideas of, of, of our colleagues who may, they may work on, on new fields, on new uh, techniques, on new um, studies, and that they didn't even publish, and they would bring over here that cutting edge. Mm -hmm. And then we would see in the, in the future, you know, we would have a vision how this may turn out in 10 years, in, in 20 years, or in five years, and what will change, how much the autogenous tissues will still there, or may not be there so much anymore. In, in also in soft tissue grafting, we see a lot of non-autogenous tissues used uh, use, um, very, very successfully, and we do that. And uh, we also do that. We also uh, published on non-autogenous soft tissue grafting, and uh, also with the bone grafting. With the bone grafting, I see, a, to me, it's still a bit slower to uh, to imagine that it's going to be completely non-autogenous. But today we will see okay. what you have to say. Right. And I think what you highlighted so well in your opening presentation is that you know this area of vertical and horizontal ridge augmentation, many view it as the holy grail in terms of developing predictable therapies. And as you, uh, you know, in some of your discussions with people learning this technique and gaining that predictability, what would you say are some of the key principles for individuals who are embarking on this procedure to have these long-term successful results? Well, number one, they, so somebody who wants to learn this, I think they have to understand the biological principles first. What you can do, what are the limitations, what are the the biological limitations and difficulties. And then you have to learn the techniques in terms of how to make a perfect flap. I like to say when you do regeneration, you're not making a full thickness flap, you're making the super full thickness flap, which is the best flap you have ever done in your life. A flap that is really like perfectly elevated, so when you stretch it, it's gonna survive. So you have to learn, and, and that's not so difficult to learn how to do that. There are you know different steps. And then uh, they're going to have to learn also what type of choices they can do in terms of techniques. There is guided bone regeneration, there are autogenous blocks, there is the bone plate techniques. And whoever wants to learn, you know, should go where they really represent that well. Okay? And then, um, of course, then you have to learn, you know, about basically if you choose guided bone regeneration, how to do the membrane placement, what, what membrane you choose, how to harvest the bone and how to stabilize the wound, and then how to close the flap perfectly above. 
Right. Yeah, and I think you highlighted some aspects that we're not used to seeing in terms of you spend a tremendous amount of time on all of the anatomical principles in revisiting the vasculature, the neuronal supply, the, uh, your ability to move these flaps up and down. And I think this is something that many people misunderstand and realizing how critical that is. Uh, because certainly on the one hand, we have all of these wonderful advances in tissue engineering, regenerative biology, but if they're not put in the hands and using, as you say, the basic biological principles and looking at the clinical techniques, and it's really the blending of those two together that I think that you highlighted so very well in your presentation. And so, uh, you know, different biomaterials, and this has probably been one of the most active areas of the research, and I think you discussed very well in terms of these perforated membranes, the, the, the circulation, the blood supply, the communication of the cells. And as you look at, you know, the next generation of regenerative approaches uh, that you're using for both the vertical and, and horizontal ridge augmentation, we started to have some of those discussions within implant dentistry and the many challenges we have with failing implants, areas of insufficient lateral bone and soft tissues. And what would you see uh, as those bigger challenges when you're working with a lot of your different participants at your meetings? Well, as, as, you, as you also highlighted, for me it's very important to teach the anatomy. Mm -hmm. So if you teach somebody the anatomy, they're going to be comfortable with the tissue. Mm -hmm. If you exactly know what's in there, you understand how that tissue behaves, you understand how much pressure you can put on a the tissue, then, then you, can, you can teach that much better. In the future, we would all obviously, um, as, as, as we discussed, you know, when we perforate the membrane, we get better results. Maybe in the future, we want to get something that we don't have to remove, you know, things like, it would be very nice that it would be very stable, but, you know, resolve in a perfect timing that it was protecting the bone graft, holding the wound stable, but once we don't need it, it should not be there. And um, that can be a membrane, for example, or that can be a, maybe a matrix without a yes. membrane that is going to hold the bone graft, or cells. And of course, I don't have a lot of in-depth in knowledge on that, but um, we're definitely going to ask you about that. Okay. <laughs> and I, I think as you highlighted in your presentation as well, as you've been advancing over time in the development of your technique, you showed long-term cases many of them 10, 15 years or longer. And you're also looking at you know, the challenge that people have in clinical practice where they're wanting to regenerate the bone with the very rapid kinetics of the bone regeneration, uh, but it does take time to mature. And so what have you seen as you know, your advancements in your approach to accelerate the bone formation that could eventually allow for earlier implant placement and potentially the earlier loading of dental implants? So, that's a great question. So number one, we started to utilize the, the resolvable membranes for horizontal ridge augmentation over 15 years ago. And at that time, we waited six months for the bone and another six months before we loaded the, the implants. The techniques, our techniques improved in terms of clinically. We just stabilized the bone graft better. So we got even more bone width. And we have realized that these resorbable membranes, they resorb, and the bone quality improved a lot. So we still go back at six months, but at six months, this bone is so stable that today our cases, uh, we started to, to see that, you know, it's so stable, it's so mature that we can load it earlier. We mm -hmm. could have done it 10 years ago, okay. but we were afraid. But now we see that, look, I mean, this implant can be loaded almost immediately or in, within six weeks. Okay. I really appreciate that. But what I don't really believe in that you really can take like, let's say, let's call it like a pregnancy bone formation, and you can take that pregnancy and make it halfway, mm -hmm. you know, like right. that you make it absolutely rapid. I see, you know, presentations and, and, and ideas that, you know, they do a bone graft and in three months they place the implant immediately load it. Right. But usually I don't see the follow-ups. And to me, I don't want to drive into a dead end street when I'm right. going to have failures after failures after three to five years. So we're very, very carefully advancing that. But I can say with a perforated membrane, the bone is, I think, maybe two months faster. Okay. And uh, the, the sausage technique, I think the implant can be loaded much earlier than we thought. Okay, yeah, and I think you're making a good point as we try to really understand 
how this wound, these wounds mature over time and the amount of bone regeneration that you receive. I think you showed very beautifully in the one case where you, know, you had great bone formation except in the middle portion of the ridge where it was insufficient where many people would still attempt to place the implant and then pack the bone around it. And I think that that was a beautiful example on how when you have such large defects, trying to regenerate that. Um, and as you spoke of the future in these membranes and how you've moved towards perforated membranes and bioresorbable membranes for some of the best results, in the future, have you started to examine the use of biologics or other types of uh, biomaterials that are coupled with these membranes to augment your results. I mean, you've already improved so much, uh, but what- We want to improve more. You, yes, okay. So preclinically, we have uh, investigated uh, a growth factor, the BMP2, that we have not published yet. And uh, we have seen that with the BMP2, if you connect it to the periosteum, in animals at least, you get amazing, uh, capacity of bone formation. But in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the human cases, we have seen a lot of swelling. We have seen, yes. you know, we, 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 are, we basically, what we're investigating now, we're also running a pretty little study, that I think the dose and the application maybe could be altered, reduced, right. and maybe that could improve the bone without, you know, this tremendous amount of swelling and things like that, and expense. Right, right. Yeah. And I... We have also published two case reports with the PDGF. One very interesting, when we have did a vertical augmentation, but also did some periodontal regeneration of neighboring tooth. And another one also with the, with the sausage, and, and, and that's all my experience with the, with, the, with the growth factors. We like both, but it's very difficult to um, access, you know, outside of the United States, some of those, uh, about some of these growth factors. But I, I see that we should not just drop them. I think they, sh they could be more investigated and, and, and really see what the clinical application in terms of dosing again and, 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 and placing them. Okay. All right. Well, you know, we're, we are in our final minute of our time that we have together. Uh, but again, I would like to thank you, uh, Professor Istvan Urban. You know, you're the founder, the leader of this symposium. Again, congratulate you, congratulating you on this tremendous success of this symposium and looking forward to you know, any last remarks that you would like yes. to, to leave yes. for our so listeners. I, thank you so much. And thank you very much for being here. And I would like to thank everybody, all the participants and the speakers who, who are being here. And, uh, but I would also like to thank to, um, you know, my team who was really helping with the organization. And specifically, this is the second symposium and my wife put together the blueprint. Okay, the, with the first one. So we only had to do like, you know, she gave us all the, the structure. So the second one was much easier. So I would like to thank you very much. Thank you.